the night of the storm. He was a robot more than a hundred years old, built by other robots in an automated factory that had been continuously engaged in the production of robots for many centuries. His name was Koronov, and as was the custom of his kind, he roamed the earth in search of interesting things to do. Koronov had climbed the highest mountains in the world with the aid of special body attachments, spikes in his metal feet, tiny but strong hooks on the ends of his twelve fingers, an emergency grappling rope coiled inside his chest area storage compartment and ready for a swift ejection if he should fall. His small anti-gravity flight motors were removed to make the climb as dangerous and therefore as interesting as possible. Having submitted to heavy-duty component sealing procedures, Kurnov had once spent 18 months underwater exploring a large portion of the Pacific Ocean until he was bored even by the mating of whales and by the ever-shifting beauty of the sea bottom. Koronov had crossed deserts, explored the Arctic Circle on foot, gone spelunking in countless different subterranean systems. He had been caught in a blizzard, in a major flood, in a hurricane, and in the middle of an earthquake that would have registered nine on the Richter scale if the Richter scale had still been in use. Once, specially insulated, he had descended halfway to the center of the earth, there to bask in pockets of glowing gases between pools of molten stone, scalded by eruptions of magma, feeling nothing. Eventually, he grew weary of even that colorful spectacle and he surfaced again. Having lived only one of his two assigned centuries, he wondered if he could last through another hundred years of such tedium. Kurnov's private counselor, a robot named Bikerman, assured him that this boredom was only temporary and easily alleviated. If one was clever, Bikerman said, one could find limitless excitement as well as innumerable valuable situations for data collection about both one's environment and one's mechanical aptitude and heritage. Bikerman, in the last half of his second century, had developed such an enormous and complex data vault that he was assigned stationary duty as a counselor, attached to a mother computer, utterly immobile. By now, extremely adept at finding excitement even through second-hand experience, Beckerman did not mourn the loss of his mobility. He was, after all, a spiritual superior to most robots, inwardly directed. Therefore, when Beckerman advised, Kurinov listened, however skeptical he might be. Kurinov's problem, according to Beckerman, was that he had started out in life from the moment he had left the factory to pit himself against the greatest of forces, the wildest sea, the coldest cold, the highest temperatures, the greatest pressures, and now, having conquered these things, he could see no interesting challenges beyond them. Yet the counselor said that Kurnov had overlooked some of the most fascinating explorations. The quality of any challenge was directly related to one's ability to meet it. The less adequate one felt, the better the experience, the richer the contest, and the more handsome the data reward. Does this suggest anything to you? Bikerman inquired without speaking, the telebeam opened between them. Nothing. So, Bikerman explained it, hand-to-hand -hand combat with a full-grown male ape might seem like an uninteresting, easy challenge at first glance. A robot was the mental and physical superior of any ape. However, one could always modify oneself in order to even the odds of what might appear to be a sure thing. If a robot couldn't fly, couldn't see as well at night as in the daylight, couldn't communicate except vocally, couldn't run faster than an antelope, couldn't hear a whisper at a thousand yards. In short, if all of his standard abilities were dulled, except for his thinking capacity, might not a robot, 
find that a hand-to-hand -hand battle with an ape was a supremely exciting event? I see your point, Kurnoff admitted. To understand the grandeur of simple things, one must humble himself. Exactly. And so it was that, on the following day, Kurnoff boarded the express train north to Montana, where he was scheduled to do some hunting in the company of four other robots, all of whom had been stripped to their essentials. Ordinarily, they would have flown under their own power. Now, none had that ability. Ordinarily, they would have used telebeams for communication. Now, they were forced to talk to one another in that curious, clicking language that had been designed especially for machines, but that robots had been able to do without for more than 600 years. Ordinarily, the thought of going north to hunt deer and wolves would have profoundly bored them. Now, however, each of them felt a curious tingle of anticipation, as if this were a more important ordeal than any he had faced before. A brisk, efficient robot named Janice met the group at the small station house just outside of Walker's Watch, toward the northernmost border of Montana. To Koronov, it was clear that Janice had spent several months in this uneventful duty assignment and that he might be near the end of his obligatory two years' service to the Central Agency. He was actually too brisk and efficient. He spoke rapidly, and he behaved altogether as if he must keep moving and doing in order not to have time to contemplate the uneventful and unexciting days that he had spent in Walker's Watch. He was one of those robots too eager for excitement. One day he would tackle a challenge that he had not been prepared for and he would end himself. Kurnov looked at Tuttle, another robot who on the train north had begun an interesting if silly argument about the development of the robot personality. He contended that until quite recently, in terms of centuries, robots hadn't possessed individual personalities. Each, Tuttle claimed, had been like the other, cold and sterile, with no private dreams. A patently ridiculous theory. Tuttle had been unable to explain how this could have been, but he'd refused to back down from his position. Now watching Janice chatter at them in a nervous staccato, Kornov was incapable of envisioning an era when the Central Agency would have dispatched mindless robots from the factories. The whole purpose of life was to explore, to carefully store data collected from an individual viewpoint, even if it was repetitive data. How could mindless robots ever function in the necessary manner? As Stefan, another of their group, had said, such theories were on par with belief in second awareness. Some believed, without evidence, that the central agency occasionally made a mistake and, when a robot's allotted lifespan was up, only partially erased his accumulated memory before refitting him and sending him out of the factory again. These robots, or so the superstitious claimed, had an advantage and were among those who matured fast enough to be elevated to duty as counselors and sometimes even to service in the central agency itself. Tuttle had been angered to hear his views on robot personality equated with wild tales of second awareness. To egg him on, Stefan also suggested that Tuttle believed in the ultimate of hobgoblins, the human being. Disgusted, Tuttle settled into a grumpy silence while the others enjoyed the jest. And now, Janice said, calling Kurnoff back from his reverie, I'll issue your supplies and see you on your way. Kurnoff, Tuttle, Stefan, Leek, and Skowski crowded forward, eager to begin the adventure. Each of the five was given binoculars of rather antique design, a pair of snowshoes that clipped and bolted to their feet, a survival pack of tools and greases, with which to repair themselves in the event of some unforeseen emergency, an electric hand torch, maps, and a drug rifle complete with an extra clip of 1,000 darts. This is all then? Leek asked. 
He had seen as much danger as Kurnov, perhaps even more, but now he sounded frightened. What else would you need? Janice asked impatiently. Leek said, Well, as you know, certain modifications have been made to us. For one thing, our eyes aren't what they were, and... You've a torch for darkness, Janice said. And then our ears, Leek began. Listen cautiously. Walk quietly, Janice suggested. We've had a power reduction to our legs, Leek said. If we should have to run, be stealthy. Creep up on your game before it knows you're there, and you'll not need to chase it. But, Leek persisted, weakened as we are, if we should have to run from something, you're only after deer and wolves, Janice reminded him. The deer won't give chase, and a wolf hasn't any taste for steel flesh. Skowski, who had thus far been exceptionally quiet, not even joining the good-natured roasting the others had given Tuttle on the train, now step forward. I've read that this part of Montana has an unusual number of unexplained reports. Reports of what? Janice asked. Skowski swept the others with his yellow visual receptors, then looked back at Janice. Well, reports of footprints similar to our own, but not those of any robot, and reports of robot-like forms seen in the woods. Oh, Janice said, waving a glittering hand, as if to brush away Skowski's suggestion like a fluff of dust. We get a dozen reports each month about human beings sighted in wilder regions northwest of here. Where we're going, Kurnoff asked. Yes, Janice said, but I wouldn't worry. In every case, those who make the reports are robots like yourselves. They've had their perceptions decreased in order to make the hunt a greater challenge for them. Undoubtedly, what they've seen has a rational explanation. If they had seen these things with their full range of perceptions, they would not have come back with these crazy tales. Does anyone besides stripped-down robots go there? Skowski asked. No, Janice said. Skowski shook his head. This isn't anything at all like I thought. It would be. I feel so weak, so... He dropped his supplies at his feet. I don't believe I want to continue with this. The others were surprised. Afraid of goblins? Stefan asked. He was the teaser in the group. No, Skowski said, but I don't like being a cripple no matter how much excitement it adds to the adventure. Very well, Janice said. There will be only four of you. Leek said, don't we get any weapons besides the drug rifle? You'll need nothing else, Janice said. Leek's query had been a strange one, Kurnov thought. The prime directive in every robot's personality installed in the factory forbade the taking of any life that could not be restored. Yet, Kurnov sympathized with Leek, shared Leek's foreboding. He supposed that, with a crippling of their perceptions, there was an inevitable clouding of the thought processes as well for nothing else explained their intense and irrational fear. Now, Janice said, the only thing you need to know is that a storm is predicted for northern Montana early tomorrow night. By then you should be to the lodge that will serve as your base of operations and the snow will pose no trouble. Questions? They had none they cared to ask. Good luck to you, Janice said and may many weeks pass before you lose interest in the challenge. That was a traditional send-off, yet Janice appeared to mean it. He would, Kurnov guessed, prefer to be hunting deer and wolves under severely restricted perceptions rather than to continue clerking at the station house and walker's watch. They thanked him, consulted their maps, left the station house, and were finally on their way. Skowski watched them go, and, when they looked back at him, waved one shiny arm in a stiff-fingered salute. They walked all that day, through the evening, and on into the long night, requiring no rest. Though the power supply to their legs had been reduced and a governor put on their walking speed, they did not become weary. They could appreciate the limitations put on their senses, but they could not actually grow tired. 
Even when the drifts were deep enough for them to break out through their wire-webbed snowshoes and bolt those in place, they maintained a steady pace. Passing across broad plains where the snow was swept into eerie peaks and twisting configurations, walking beneath the dense roof of crossed pine boughs in the virgin forests, Kurnoff felt a tingle of anticipation that had been missing from his exploits for some years now. Because his perceptions were so much less acute than usual, he sensed danger in every shadow, imagined obstacles and complications around every turn. It was positively exhilarating to be here. Before dawn, a light snow began to fall, clinging to their cold steel skin. Two hours later, by the day's first light, they crested a small ridge and looked out across an expanse of pine woods to the lodge on the other side of a shallow valley. The place was made of a burnished, bluish metal, oval windows, Quonset walls, functional. We'll be able to get some hunting in today, Stefan said. Let's go, Tuttle said. Single file, they went down into the valley, crossed it, and came out almost at the doorstep of the lodge. Kurnov pulled the trigger. The magnificent buck, decorated with a twelve-point rack of antlers, reared up onto its hind legs, pawing at the air, breathing steam. A hit! Leek cried. Kurnov fired again. The buck went down onto all four legs. The other deer behind it in the woods turned and galloped back along the well-trampled trail. The buck shook its huge head, staggered forward as if to follow its companions, stopped abruptly, and then settled onto its haunches. After one last valiant effort to regain its footing, it fell sideways into the snow. Congratulations, Stefan said. The four robots rose from the drift where they'd concealed themselves when the deer had come into sight, and they crossed the small open field to the sleeping buck. Kurnoff bent and felt the creature's sedated heartbeat, watched its grainy black nostrils quiver as it took a shallow breath. Tuttle, Stefan, and Leek crowded in, squatting around the creature, touching it, marveling at the perfect musculature, the powerful shoulders, and the hard-packed thighs. They agreed that bringing down such a brute when one's senses were drastically damped was indeed a challenge. Then, one by one, they got up and walked away, leaving Kurinov alone to more fully appreciate his triumph and to carefully collect and record his own emotional reactions to the event in the microtapes of his data vault. Kurnov was nearly finished with his evaluation of the challenge and of the resultant confrontation, and the buck was beginning to regain its senses when Tuttle cried out as if his systems had been accidentally overloaded. Here! Look here! Tuttle stood two hundred yards away, near the dark trees, waving his arms. Stefan and Leek were already moving toward him. At Kurnov's feet, the buck snorted and tried to stand, failed to manage that yet, and blinked its gummed eyelids. With nothing more to record in his data vault, Kurnov rose and left the beast, walked toward his three companions. What is it? he asked when he arrived. They stared at him with glowing amber visual receptors that seemed especially bright in the gray light of late afternoon. There! Tuttle said, pointing to the ground before them. Footprints, Kornoff said. Leek said, they don't belong to any of us. So? Kornoff asked. And they're not robot prints, Tuttle said. Of course they are. Tuttle said, look closer. Kornoff bent and realized that his eyes, with half their power gone, had at first deceived him in the weak light. These weren't robot prints in anything but shape. A robot's feet were cross-hatched with rubber tread. These prints showed none of that. A robot's feet were bottomed with two holes that acted as vents for the anti-grav system when the unit was in flight. These prints showed no holes. Kurnoff said, I didn't know there were any apes in the north. There aren't, Tuttle said. Then, these, Tuttle said, are the prints 
of a man. Preposterous, Stefan said. How else do you explain them? Tuttle asked. He didn't sound happy with his explanation, but he was prepared to stick with it until someone offered an acceptable alternative. A hoax, Stefan said. Perpetrated by whom? Tuttle asked. One of us. They looked at one another, as if the guilt would be evident in their identical metal faces. Then Leek said, That's no good. We've been together. These tracks were made recently, or they'd be covered over with snow. None of us has had a chance all afternoon to sneak off and form them. I still say it's a hoax, Stefan insisted. Perhaps someone was sent out by the Central Agency to leave these for us to find. Why would Central bother? Tuttle asked. Maybe it's part of our therapy, Stefan said. Maybe this is to sharpen the challenge for us, add excitement to the hunt. He gestured vaguely at the prince, as if he hoped they'd vanish. Maybe Central does this for everyone who's troubled by boredom, to restore the sense of wonder that... That's highly unlikely, Tuttle said. You know that it's the responsibility of each individual to engineer his own adventures and to generate his own storable responses. The Central Agency never interferes. It is merely a judge. After that fact, it evaluates us and gives us promotions to those whose data vaults have matured. By way of cutting the argument short, Kornov said, Where did these prints lead? Leek indicated the marks with a shiny finger. It looks as if the creature came out of the woods and stood here for a while, perhaps watching us while we stalked the buck. Then he turned and went back the way he came. The four robots followed the footprints into the first of the pine trees, but they hesitated to go into the deeper regions of the forest. Darkness is coming, Leek said. The storm's almost on us, as Janice predicted. With our senses as restricted as they are, we should be getting back to the lodge while we've still enough light to see by. Kurnov wondered if their surprising cowardice was as evident to the others as it was to him. They all professed not to believe in the monsters of myth, and yet they rebelled at following these footprints. Kurnov had to admit, however, that when he tried to envision the beast that might have made these tracks, a man, he was more anxious than ever to reach the sanctity of the lodge. The lodge had only one room, which was all they required. Since each of the four was physically identical to the others, no one felt a need for geographical privacy. Each could obtain a more rewarding isolation merely by tuning out all the exterior events in one of the lodge's inactivation nooks, thereby dwelling strictly within his mind, recycling old data and searching for previously overlooked juxtapositions of seemingly unrelated information. Therefore, no one was discomforted by the single, gray-walled, nearly featureless room where they would spend as much as several weeks together, barring any complications or any lessening of their interest in the challenge of the hunt. They racked their drug rifles on a metal shelf that ran the length of one wall, and they unbolted their other supplies that, until now, they had clipped to various portions of their body shells. As they stood at the largest window, watching the snow sheet past them in a blinding white fury, Tuttle said, If the myths are true, think what would be done to modern philosophy. What myths? Kornoff asked. About human beings. Stefan, as rigid as ever, was quick to counter the thrust of Tuttle's undeveloped line of thought. He said, I've seen nothing to make me believe in myths. Tuttle was wise enough just then, to avoid an argument about the footprints in the snow, but he was not prepared to drop the conversation altogether. We've always thought that intelligence was a manifestation solely of the mechanized mind. If we should find that a fleshy creature could... But none can, Stefan interrupted. Kurinov thought that Stefan must be rather young, no more than thirty or forty years out of the factory. Otherwise, he would not be so quick to reject anything that even slightly threatened the status quo that the Central Agency had outlined and established. With the decades, Kurnov knew, one learned that what had once been impossible was now considered only commonplace. 
There are myths about human beings, Tuttle said, which say that robots sprang from them. From flesh? Stefan asked, incredulous. I know it sounds odd, Tuttle said, but at various times in my life, I have seen the oddest things prove true. You've been all over the earth and more corners than I have been. In all your travels, you must have seen tens of thousands of fleshy species, animals of all descriptions. Stefan paused for effect. Have you ever encountered a single fleshy creature with even rudimentary intelligence in the manner of the robot? Never, Tuttle admitted. Flesh was not designed for high-level sentience, Stefan said. They were quiet. The snow fell, pulling the gray sky closer to the land. None would admit the private fear he nurtured. Many things fascinate me. Tuttle said, surprising Koronov, who had thought that the other robot was done with his postulating. For one, where did the central agency come from? What were its origins? Stefan waved a hand despairingly. There has always been a central agency. But that's no answer, Tuttle said. Why isn't it? Stefan asked. For all intents and purposes, we accept that there has always been a universe, stars and planets, and everything in between. Suppose, Tuttle said, just for the sake of argument, that there has not always been a central agency. The agency is constantly doing research into its own nature, redesigning itself. Vast stores of data are transferred into increasingly sophisticated repositories every 50 to 100 years. Isn't it possible that occasionally the agency loses bits and pieces, accidentally destroys some of its memory in the move? Impossible, Stefan said. There are any number of safeguards taken against such an eventuality. Kurinov, aware of many of the central agency's bungles over the past hundred years, was not so sure. He was intrigued by Tuttle's theory. Tuttle said, if the central agency somehow lost most of its early stores of data, its knowledge of human beings might have vanished along with countless other bits and pieces. Stefan was disgusted. Earlier you ranted against the idea of second awareness, but now you can believe this? You amuse me, Tuttle. Your data vault must be a trove of silly information, contradictory beliefs, and useless theorizing. If you believe in these human beings, then do you also believe in all the attendant myths? Do you think they can only be killed with an instrument of wood? Do you think they sleep at night in dark rooms? Sleep like beasts? And do you think that, though they're made of flesh, they cannot be dispatched, but that they can pop up somewhere else in a new body? Confronted with these obviously insupportable superstitions, Tuttle backed down from his entire point. He turned his amber visual receptors on the snow beyond the window. I was only supposing. I was just spinning a little fantasy to help pass the time. Triumphant, Stefan said. However, fantasy doesn't contribute to a maturation of one's data vault. And I suppose that you're eager to mature enough to gain a promotion from the agency? Tuttle said. Of course, Stefan said. We're only allotted 200 years. And besides, what else is the purpose of life? Perhaps to have an opportunity to mull over his strange theories, Tuttle soon retired to an inactivation nook in the wall beneath the metal shelf on which the guns lay. He slid in feet first and pulled the hatch shut behind his head, leaving the others to their own devices. Fifteen minutes later, Leek said, I believe I'll follow Tuttle's example. I need time to consider my responses to this afternoon's hunt. Kurnov knew that Leek was only making excuses to be gone. He was not a particularly gregarious robot and seemed most comfortable when he was ignored and left to himself. Alone with Stefan in the lodge, Kurnov was now in an unpleasantly delicate position. He felt that he too needed time to think inside a deactivation nook. However, he did not want to hurt Stefan's feelings did not want to give him the impression that they were all anxious to be away from him. For the most part, Kurnov liked the young robot. Stefan was fresh, energetic, 
obviously a first-line mentality. The only thing he found grating about the youth was his innocence, his undisciplined drive to be accepted and to achieve. Time, of course, would mellow Stefan and hone his mind, so he did not deserve to be hurt. How, then, to excuse oneself without slighting Stefan in any way? The younger robot solved the problem by suggesting that he, too, needed time in a nook. When Stefan was safely shut away, Kurnoff went to the fourth of the five wall slots, slid into it, pulled the hatch shut, and felt all of his senses drain away from him so that he was only a mind, floating in darkness, contemplating the wealth of ideas in his data vault. Adrift in nothingness, Kurinov considered the superstition that had begun to be the center of this adventure, the human being, the man. 1. Though of flesh, the man thinks and knows. 2. He sleeps by night, like an animal. 3. He devours other flesh, as does the beast. 4. He defecates. 5. He dies and rots is susceptible to disease and corruption. 6. He spawns his young in a terrifyingly unmechanical way, and yet his young are also sentient. 7. He kills. 8. He can overpower a robot. 9. He dismantles robots, though none but other men know what he does with their parts. 10. He is the antithesis of the robot. If the robot represents the proper way of life, man is the improper. 11. Man stalks in safety, registering to the robot's senses, unless clearly seen as only another harmless animal, until it is too late. 12. He can be prematurely killed only with a wooden implement. Wood is the product of an organic life form, yet it lasts, as metal does, halfway between flesh and metal. It can destroy human flesh. 13. If killed in any other way, by any other means other than wood, the man will only appear to be dead. In reality, the moment that he drops before his assailant, he at once springs to life elsewhere, unharmed, in a new body. Although the list goes on, Kurnov abandons that avenue of thought, for it disturbs him deeply. Tuttle's fantasy can be nothing more than that. Conjecture, supposition, imagination. If the human being actually existed, how could one believe the central agency's primary role, that the universe is, in every way, entirely logical and rational? The rifles are gone, Tuttle said when Kornoff slid out of the deactivation nook and got to his feet. Gone! All of them! That's why I recalled you! Gone? Kornoff asked, looking at the shelf where the weapons had been. Gone where? Leek's taken them, Stefan said. He stood by the window, his long bluish arms beaded with cold droplets of water precipitated out of the air. Is Leek gone too? Kornoff asked. Yes. He thought about this, then said, but where would he go in the storm, and why would he need all the rifles? I'm sure it's nothing to be concerned about, Stefan said. He must have had a good reason, and he can tell us all about it when he comes back. Tuttle said, if he comes back. Kurnoff said, Tuttle, you sound as if you think he might be in danger. In light of what's happened recently, those prints we found, I'd say that could be a possibility. Stefan scoffed at this. Whatever's happening, Tuttle said, you must admit it's odd. He turned to Koronov. I wish we hadn't submitted to the operations before we came out here. I'd do anything to have my full senses again. He hesitated. I think we have to find Leek. He'll be back, Stefan argued. He'll return when he wants to return. I'm still in favor of initiating a search, Tuttle said. Kurnov went to the window and stood next to Stefan, gazing out at the driving snow. The ground was covered with at least twelve inches of new powder, 
The proud trees had been bowed under the white weight, and snow continued to fall faster than Kurnov had ever seen it in all his many journeys. Well, Tuttle asked again. I concur, Kurnov said. We should look for him, but we should do it together. With our lessened perceptions, we might easily get separated and lost out there. If one of us became damaged in a fall, he might experience a complete battery depletion before anyone found him. You're right, Tuttle said. He turned to Stefan. And you? Oh, all right, Stefan said crossly. I'll come along. Their torches cut bright wounds in the darkness, but it did little to melt through the curtain of wind-driven snow. They walked abreast around the lodge, continuing a circle search. Each time that they completed another turn about the building, they widened their search pattern. They decided to cover all the open land, but they would not enter the forest even if they hadn't located Leek elsewhere. They agreed to this limitation, though none, not even Stefan, admitted that half the reason for ignoring the woods was a purely irrational fear of what might live among the trees. In the end, however, it was not necessary to enter the woods, for they found Leek less than twenty yards away from the lodge. He was lying on his side in the snow. He's been terminated, Stefan said. The others didn't need to be told. Both of Leek's legs were missing. Who could have done something like this? Stefan asked. Neither Tuttle nor Koronov answered him. Leek's head hung limply on his neck, because several of the links in his ring cable had been bent out of alignment. His visual receptors had been smashed, and the mechanism behind them ripped out through the shattered sockets. When Kurnov bent closer, he saw that someone had poked a sharp object into Leek's data vaults, threw his eye tubes, and scrambled his tapes into a useless mess. He hoped that poor Leek had been dead by then. Horrible, Stefan said. He turned away from the grisly scene began to walk back to the lodge, but stopped abruptly as he realized that he should not be out of the other robot's company. He shuddered mentally. What should we do with him? Tuttle asked. Leave him, Koronov said. Here to rust? He'll sense nothing more. Still, we should be getting back, Koronov said, shining his light around the snowy scene. We shouldn't expose ourselves. Keeping close to one another, they returned to the lodge. As they walked, Kurnov reviewed certain disturbing data. 9. He dismantles robots, though none but other men know what he does with their parts. As I see it, Kurnov told them, when they were once again in the lodge, Leek did not take the rifles. Someone or something entered the lodge to steal them. Leek must have come out of his inactivation nook just as the culprits were leaving. Without pausing to wake us, he gave chase. Or was forced to go with him, Tuttle said. I doubt that he was taken out by force, Kornov said. In the lodge, with enough light to see by and enough space to maneuver in, even with lessened perceptions, Lee could have kept himself from being hurt or forced to leave. However, once he was outside in the storm, he was at their mercy. The wind screamed across the peaked roof of the lodge, rattled the windows in their metal frames. The three remaining robots stood still, listening until the gust died away, as though the noise were made not by the wind, but by some enormous beast that had reared up over the building and was intent on tearing it to pieces. Kurnov went on. When I examined Leek, I found that he was felled by a sharp blow to the ring cable just under the head the kind of blow that would have had to come suddenly from behind and without warning. In a room as well lighted as this, nothing could have gotten behind Leek without his knowing it was there. Stefan turned away from the window and said, Do you think that Leek was already terminated when... His voice trailed away, but in a moment he had found the discipline to go on. Was he terminated when they dismantled his legs? We can only hope that he was, Kurnov said. Stefan said, who could have done such a thing? A man, Tuttle said. Or men, Kurnov amended. No, 
Stefan said, but his denial was not as adamant as it had been before. What would they have done with his legs? No one knows what they do with what they take, Kornoff said. Stefan said, you sound as if Tuttle's convinced you, as if you believe in these creatures. Until I have a better answer to the questions of who terminated Leek, I think it's safest to believe in human beings, Kornoff explained. For a time, they were silent. Then Kurnoff said, I think we should start back to Walker's Watch in the morning, first thing. They'll think we're immature, Stefan said, if we come back with wild tales about men prowling around the lodge in the darkness. You saw how disdainful Janus was of others who had made similar reports. We have poor, dead Leek as proof, Tuttle said. Or, Koronov said, we can say Leek was terminated in an accident and we're returning because we're bored with the challenge. You mean we wouldn't even have to mention human beings? Stefan asked. Possibly, Koronov said. That would be the best way to handle it by far, Stefan said. Then, no second-hand reports of our temporary irrationality would get back to the agency. We could spend much time in the inactivation nooks until we were finally able to perceive the real explanation of Leek's termination, which somehow now eludes us. If we meditate long enough, a proper solution is bound to arise. Then by the time of our next data vault audits by the agency, we'll have covered all traces of this illogical reaction from which we now suffer. However, Tuttle said, we might already know the real story of Leek's death. After all, we've seen the footprints in the snow, and we've seen the dismantled body. Could it be that men, human beings, really are behind it? No, Stefan said. That's superstitious nonsense. That's irrational. At dawn, Kornoff said, we'll set out for Walker's watch, no matter how bad the storm is by then. As he finished speaking, the distant hum of the lodge generator, which was a comforting background noise that never abated, abruptly cut out. They were plunged into darkness. With snow crusted on their chilled metal skins, they focused three electric torches on the compact generator in its niche behind the lodge. The top of the machine casing had been removed, exposing the complex inner works to the elements. Someone's removed the power core, Kornov said. But who? Stefan asked. Kurnov directed the beam of his torch to the ground. The others did likewise. Mingled with their own footprints were other prints similar to, but not made by, any robot. Those same strange tracks that they had seen near the trees in the late afternoon. The same tracks that profusely marked the snow all around Leek's body. No, Stefan said. No, no. No, I think it's best that we set out for Walker's watch tonight, Kornoff said. I don't think it would any longer be wise to wait until morning. He looked at Tuttle, to whom clung snow in icy clumps. What do you think? Agreed, Tuttle said. But I suspect it's not going to be an easy journey. I wish I had all my senses up to full power. We can still move fast, Kornoff said, and we don't need to rest, as fleshy creatures must. If we're pursued, we have the advantage, in theory, Tuttle said. We'll have to be satisfied with that. Kurinov considered certain aspects of the myth. Seven, he kills. Eight, he can overpower a robot. In the lodge, by the eerie light of their hand torches, they bolted on their snowshoes, attached their emergency repair kits, and picked up their maps. The beams of their lamps preceding them, they went outside again, staying together. The wind beat upon their broad backs while the snow worked hard to coat them in hard-packed, icy suits. They crossed the clearing, half by dead reckoning and half by the few landmarks that the torches revealed, each wishing to himself that he had his full powers of sight and his radar back in operation again. Soon they came to the opening in the trees that led down the side of the valley and back toward Walker's Watch. They stopped there, staring into the dark tunnel formed by sheltering pines, and they seemed reluctant to go any farther. 
There are so many shadows, Tuttle said. Shadows can't hurt us, Koronov said. Throughout their association, from the moment they had met one another on the train coming north, Koronov had known that he was the leader among them. He had exercised his leadership sparingly, but now he must take full command. He started forward into the trees between the shadows, moving down the snowy slope. Reluctantly, Stefan followed. Tuttle came last. Halfway down toward the valley floor, the tunnel between the trees narrowed drastically. The trees loomed closer, spread their boughs lower, and it was here, in these tight quarters, in the deepest shadows, that they were attacked. Something howled in triumph, its mad voice echoing above the constant whine of the wind. Kurnov whirled, not certain from which direction the sound had come, lancing the trees with torchlight. Behind, Tuttle cried out. Kurnov turned as Stefan did, and their torches illuminated the struggling robot. It can't be, Stefan said. Tuttle had fallen back under the relentless attack of a two-legged creature that moved almost as a robot might move, though it was clearly an animal. It was dressed in furs, its feet booted, and it wielded a metal axe. It drove the blunted blade at Tuttle's ring cable. Tuttle raised an arm, threw back the weapon, saved himself at the cost of a severely damaged elbow joint. Kurnov started forward to help, but was stopped as a second of the fleshy beasts delivered a blow from behind. The weapon struck the center of Kurnov's back and drove him to his knees. Kurnov fell sideways, rolled, got to his feet in a one well-coordinated maneuver. He turned quickly to confront his assailant. A fleshy face stared back at him from a dozen feet away, blowing steam into the cold air. It was framed in a fur-lined hood, a grotesque parody of a robot face. Its eyes were too small for visual receptors, and they did not glow. Its face was not perfectly symmetrical as it should have been. It was out of proportion, also puffed and mottled from the cold. It did not even shine in the torchlight, and yet, yet, obvious intelligence abided there. No doubt malevolent intelligence, perhaps even manacle, but intelligence nonetheless. Surprisingly, the monster spoke to Koronov. Its voice was deep, its language full of rounded, softened syllables, not at all like the clattering language the robots spoke to one another. Abruptly, the beast leapt forward, crying out, and swung a length of metal pipe at Kurnov's neck. The robot danced backward out of range. The demon came forward. Kurnov glanced at the others and saw that the first demon had backed Tuttle almost into the woods. A third had attacked Stefan, who was barely managing to hold his own. Screaming, the man before Kurnov charged, plowed the end of the pipe into Kurnov's chest. The robot fell hard. The man came in close, raising his bludgeon. Man thinks, though he's of flesh, sleeps as an animal sleeps, devours other flesh, defecates, rots, dies. He spawns his young in an unmechanical manner. Although his young are sentient, he kills. He kills. He overpowers robots, dismantles them, and does monstrous things. What? With their parts. He can be killed permanently only with a wooden implement. And if killed in any other manner, he does not die a true death, but at once springs up elsewhere in a new body. As the monster swung his club, Kurnov rolled, rose, and struck out with his long fingered hand. The man's face tore, gave blood. The demon stepped back, bewildered. Kurnov's terror had changed into rage. He stepped forward and struck out again and again, flailing with all his reduced strength. He broke the demon's body, temporarily killed it, leaving the snow spattered with blood. Turning from his own assailant, he moved on the beast that was after Stefan. Clubbing it from behind, he broke its neck with one blow of his steel hand. 
By the time Kurnov reached Tuttle and dispatched the third demon, Tuttle had sustained one totally demolished arm, another smashed hand, and damage to the ring cable that, luckily, had not terminated him. With any luck, the three robots would survive. I thought I was finished, Tuttle said. Dazed, Stefan said to Kurnov, You killed all three of them. They would have terminated us, Kurnov said. Inside, where they could not see, he was in turmoil. Stefan said, But the prime directive from the central agency forbids the taking of life. Not quite, Kurnov disagreed. It forbids the taking of life which cannot be restored, which cannot be restored. These lives will be restored? Stefan asked, looking at the hideous corpses, unable to understand. You've seen human beings now, Kurnov said. Do you believe the myths, or do you still scoff? How can I scoff? Then, Kurnov said, if you believe that such demons exist, you must believe what else is said of them. He quoted his own store of data on the subject. If killed in any other way, by any means other than wood, the man will only appear to be dead. In reality, the moment he drops before his assailant, he springs at once to life elsewhere, unharmed, in a new body. Stefan nodded, unwilling to argue the point. Tuttle said, what now? We continue back to Walker's watch, Kornoff said, and tell them what we found? No. But, Tuttle said, we can lead them back here. Show them these carcasses. Look around you, Kurnoff said. Other demons are watching from the trees. A dozen hateful white faces could be seen leering. Kurnoff said, I don't think they'll attack us again. They've seen what we can do. How we have learned that, with them, the prime directive does not apply. But they're sure to remove and bury the bodies when we've gone. We can take a carcass along with us. Tuttle said. Kurnoff said, no, both of your hands are useless. Stefan's right arm is uncontrollable. I couldn't carry one of those bodies all by myself as far as Walker's ranch, not with my power as reduced as it is. Then, Tuttle said, we still won't tell anyone about what we've seen up here? We can't afford to, if we ever want to be promoted, Kurnoff said. Our only hope is to spend a long time in some inactivation nook contemplating until we've learned to cope with what we've witnessed. They picked their torches out of the snow and, staying close to one another, started down toward the valley once more. Walk slowly and show no fear, Koronov warned. They walked slowly, but each was certain that his fear was evident to the unearthly creatures crouching in the shadows beneath the pine trees. They walked all that long night and most of the following day before they reached the station house at Walker's Watch. In that time, the storm died out. The landscape was serene, white, peaceful. Surveying the rolling snow fields, one felt sure that the universe was rational. But Kurinov was haunted by one icy realization. If he must believe in specters and other worldly beings like men, then he would never again be able to think of the universe in rational terms.